Okay, so the topic for uh, today's workshop is why is the universe finding new life? And Earl Grey gave that uh, really accelerated whirlwind tour of apologetics. And he mentioned the fine tuning of one of the uh, main arguments of the existence of God. And so that's what I'll be focusing on tonight, just that one argument, uh, the fine tuning argument. So I'm going to start by just defining fine tuning, uh, discuss what it's about. And uh, fine tuning is one of, as I mentioned, the, one of the main pillars or the arguments for the existence of God. The other one, the cosmological argument, is being discussed uh, by another one of our speakers, Doug uh, Guybet. Um, and both of these, interestingly, both of these arguments became possible uh, in the 20th century uh, because of discoveries in science. And so fine tuning is one of those that became possible in the 20th century because of discoveries in physics and cosmology in particular. So physicists and, physicists and cosmologists have discovered that if certain properties of the universe were changed very slightly from what they actually are, we would not be here. They have to be within a very narrow range for our universe to be life permitting or habitable. So I'll use those phrases interchangeably tonight. Life permitting or habitable. The sensitivity of the habitability of the universe to small changes in its properties is called fine tuning. Now, this is widely believed by prominent physicists and cosmologists today. You've probably heard of some of these names. And uh, the first really good instance of this was discovered by Fred Hoyle, of all people, uh, who's not a religious person, right? He was an atheist, uh, although at some point George later in his life, maybe he moved to something like Buddhism, perhaps. But um, certainly at the time he made this discovery, he was an atheist. Uh, but also Paul Davies, Martin Rees, who's astronomer Royale in Britain, Max Tegmark, Bernard Carr, Frank Tibbler, John Barrow, Stephen Hawking, all believe in the reality of fine tuning. Um, and you can hear these people quoted often in the news you know, when there's something um, uh, new in cosmology. So they're very prominent quotes. Let me just give you some quotes. This is by Martin Rees. The possibility of life as we know it depends on the values of a few basic physical constants and is, in some respects, remarkably sensitive to the numerical values. Nature does exhibit remarkable coincidences. Paul Davies, the present arrangement of matter indicates a very special choice of initial conditions. Stephen Hawking, the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers, i.e. the constants of physics, seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. I, you see things mentioned here like um, initial conditions, constants. Um, what exactly does fine tuning refer to? So I think it's helpful to divide up the types of fine tuning into three categories, three categories of fine tuning. The first one I'll mention is called fine tuning of the laws of nature. And so the very existence and the forms of physical laws describing forces, the types of particles, quantum principles, dimensionality of space time. So uh, the, the very existence of certain principles of quantum mechanics, like the Pauli exclusion principle, almost by itself that dictates how the electrons are arranged in atoms and pretty much determines the structure of the whole periodic table, and therefore all of chemistry. I mean, if it were not for that pr principle by itself, we wouldn't have chemistry okay, in our universe. Uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the growth wave principle, various principles of physics. Not only do they have to be the right form, but they have to exist to, to begin with to have a universe that can support life. So let me give you an example of the, the simple law. This is Newton's version of the law of gravity. We now know it's an approximation following Einstein, uh, but we'll just work with the equation in this form. Uh, so it says the force of gravity between two masses M1 and M2 uh, is, it, sorry, the force of gravity is proportional to the product of the masses M1 and M2 and inversely proportional to the inverse square of their separation. Okay, so it's, it's an inverse square type law. So it's a, and this, this is a pretty simple law, but the form of the law, how the parameters are related to each other, uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about by the law of physics, or the law of nature, it's, it's the form of the relationship between these various parameters, that, that has to be fine-tuned, the logic. If 
be the second category of fine-tuning that you'll see discussed in the literature is the fine-tuning of the constants. Now, a constant will be something like big G in that equation, universal constant of gravity. Okay, so you can talk about the form of the physical law, it's an inverse squared law, depends on the product of the masses, and then you can talk about the value of the constant that takes it from a proportionality and makes it an equation. And so there are other constants. The masses of the fundamental particles, the electron, the proton, masses of the quarks, uh, and so on. Uh, the, str uh, the strengths of the force is not just gravity, but there are three other forces, electromagnetism, weak force, and nuclear force. I'll get back to those in a little bit. And uh, there's something called the cosmological constant. Uh, I'll discuss that one in detail uh, later on tonight. And finally, the fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe. Some of these include the initial entropy, again, something I'll get to a little later, initial expansion rate, initial density fluctuations, inflation, and the initial antimatter matter ratio of the universe. Here's an illustration uh, to help you keep these straight in your mind. Um, imagine just throwing a ball up in the air. So you give it a certain initial velocity, initial speed, a uh, certain angle that you throw it. So those initial conditions, the initial angle, the initial speeds, those will be initial conditions, right, for that ball taking off. Um, then you can calculate its trajectory. And you, you need a, a physical law called the law of gravity. That's what you use to calculate the trajectory of that ball. Maybe you throw in some resistance, your resistance is another law. Um, and you can alter one of the constants in your law, like the acceleration of gravity, uh, either little g or big g for those of you who've taken physics. So that'll be an illustration of, of, of uh, an analogy, something you're familiar with that's similar to, to talking about uh, the universe. Here's another illustration. Suppose you purchase an app for your tablet, so I'll come up to uh, modern technology. I just got my smartphone for the first time in May. Now everybody has one. It's like, I don't know, it's feeling left out. So you can get apps for these tablets and smartphones, right? Some, many of them are free, some of them you have to pay for. Well, this app is about a trillion dollars. It's called the Universe Generating Machine, the Universe Creating Machine. So this is the app interface, and it's a wirelessly interface to some little powerful machine somewhere you don't know where. And your app interface has all these little dials on it. If you can't read them on there, it uh, says uh, initial density fluctuations, weak force, strong force, proton to neutron mass ratio, gravitational force, cosmological constant, electromagnetic force, you can tweak these dials. Now, the instructions say that this is set for the current uh, values of these parameters in our universe. And you can adjust them either by turning the dials or by typing in specific numbers. So you can look at the number corresponding to uh, one of those settings there with the numerical digital display. Uh, so you need to have very specific value. Uh, you can tweak it just ever so slightly. Now, the instructions always also say, just hit preview. Do not hit the start button. Okay? <laughs> hit preview first. And you'll find that you start tweak playing with it and tweaking all the knobs, and you'll find every time you hit preview, you get this universe that is totally impossible for life to, to exist in. One that expands very quickly, one that generates only black holes, uh, one that uh, it collapses in on itself about a millionth of a second after it originates, and so on. And you'll find that it's incredibly sensitive. The, the way the universe looks is very sensitive to the particular settings of those dials. And so that's sort of an analogy to the way our universe is. Okay? It's balanced on a razor's edge. If you tweak some of the parameters just a little bit, you'll find that you get a totally lifeless uh, universe, one that is not habitable. And by the way, the app is coded. The reason it's so expensive is because it's coded with all the latest physics, the best physical models we have, and so it does all the necessary calculations for you. Uh, and of course, it's also expensive because it's connected to this big, powerful machine. Okay, now I'd like to go over uh, some possible objections. So you may be thinking in your mind, okay, well, but what about this? What about that? Uh, so at this point, I'd like to come up, um, or rather discuss some objections that come up as a way of clarifying the issues so that you can understand better what fine-tuning is really about. Okay, so here's the first possible objection. How can
can't get a sign of probability if the sample size is precise in one universe, right? Because this is the only universe we know exists. So you can't, for example, say one in a hundred universes would have one. So the way we assign probabilities to things is usually to have uh, samples, right? So imagine if you're a manufacturer, you make rulers, and you, you say to the person on the floor who's at the assembly line, okay, I want you to uh, give me rulers that are 1% accuracy. Um, you know, how many do we need to make, and so on. Well, that's based on statistical analyses of the rulers that are made by your machine, and you get a, a large sample, and figure out uh, you know, how often a 1% precision ruler comes along. You need a sample. Well, that's not really relevant to this particular case. And you can use a universe creating machine to understand why. Run your universe creating machine with a different setting and place a black dot if it makes a non-habitable universe. Place a white dot when it is ha habitable. You'll find that there's a little white dot in a sea of black dots. That, little, that red arrow, in case you can't see it, is pointing to the one white dot there. So what you find is that we are in this sea of uh, possible universes that are all uninhabitable. Okay? They're all lifeless universe, universes. So that's the sense in which we mean that it is improbable to get a universe like ours that is fine-tuned with new life. Okay? The, the, the possible parameter space... Um, universes around us are nearly all dead universes, if you want to put it that way. Okay, second objection. What about universes governed by different laws of nature that allow radically different forms of life than those in our universe? Okay, maybe the constants and initial conditions. Those universes aren't fine-tuned, so we're just familiar with our universe and small changes to our universe. What about very different universes where you radically change things and have radically different forms of life? The answer to this question is not relevant to explaining the fine-tuning of our universe. And um, John Leslie, a philosopher, gave a nice illustration uh, to show this. And uh, again, I'm, I'm going to use black dots to illustrate this. But each black dot here represents a fly on the side of a barn. Imagine that there are flies all over the side of the barn except uh, for an empty patch, a circular patch, um, on the barn, side of the barn. And there's one fly in the middle of that empty patch. You can see that fly there with, with its white. Suppose you take an arrow and shoot it. You're far away. You take an arrow and shoot it. And you hit that one lone fly in the middle of the empty patch, even though there are flies on the other part. Would you say he's a good marksman? Yes. Yes, I would say he's a good marksman. So that's analogous to our universe. Suppose the screen represents habitable universes in some kind of a possible universe parameter space. And uh, this white circle represents universes that, uh, for which life is not possible. And we're there. We're there in this white area um, with lots of white area around us. Now, there may be green area, habitable universes outside of that white patch. But we're in the middle of this white patch uh, where if you tweak the parameters of our, our universe just a little bit, you get lifeless universes. And so on. It's still the case that our universe is fine-tuned for life, even if large changes in parameters lead to other radically different universes that might have life in them. We still have to explain our universe. Okay. Third possible objection is kind of related to that one. If the constants and initial conditions had been different, we wouldn't exist. But maybe other forms of life would have been possible given the same laws. So now you're not making such large radical changes. You're making somewhat modest changes, um, and you maybe you keep the laws the same, but change some of the constants and initial conditions. Uh, maybe other other forms of life would be possible. Uh, something like that, perhaps. Oh, I don't really see it. But <coughs> now that's perhaps possible. Maybe can't rule it out completely. Uh, but several examples of fine tuning that I'll be presenting tonight would prevent even the precursors to life. No planet, no galaxies, no chemistry whatsoever. Like I said earlier, you can tweak some of the parameters just a little bit, and you end up with a universe that's all black holes, you know, or one that collapses around itself almost as soon as it starts expanding, or expands so quickly that everything's just di di diluted and diffused, and just hydrogen atoms floating around. Now, actually, I think even this possibility is unlikely because we're also discovering examples of fine-tuning.
Indian chemistry. Uh, I don't have time to get into this, uh, but uh, I recommend a book by Michael Denton called Nature's Destiny. How many of you have read that? I've heard of it. Okay. Got two, couple, three people. And he discusses examples uh, uh, in, in chemistry of, of carbon chemistry and water chemistry essential for life and why they're essential for life and the peculiar characteristics of carbon chemistry and, and the peculiar properties of the water molecule that are so life essential. Now, he wasn't the first to notice that. That had been noticed actually in the early 1800s. And there's a famous book written by Lawrence Henderson, a Harvard chemist in 1913 uh, called The Fitness of the Environment. Uh, and basically, Denton's book is an update to that. But that book has stood the test of time, Lawrence Henderson's book. Uh, he was right to uh, show that there's something special about the carbon chemistry and water chemistry for life, and it was not satisfied by any other element of periodic table. And so it does seem that the fine-tuning extends even into chemistry. It's not just uh, in physics and, uh, and, and cosmology. Okay. Objections for now. I'll come back to some more objections towards the end. So let me get back into uh, defining fine tuning. Uh, in this case, I'm going to illustrate it with, with a ruler. So consider, a, again, a ruler analogy. Uh, let's say a ruler manufacturer could make rulers with an accuracy of one centimeter. It's not very good, it's just a number I picked. Now that's a dimensional quantity. There's a number and then a dimension associated with it, right? So the dimensions are centimeters. Now a more useful quantity especially when we apply it to discussion of fine-tuning, is of the relative error. Okay, that's a dimensionless quantity. So you divide, say, the precision or the accuracy by the length. And so the units cancel out. And so for a 10-centimeter ruler, a ruler that's 10 centimeters long, uh, the relative error of 1 centimeter is 10%. For a 100-centimeter ruler, it's 1%. Okay, so it's limitless. So it doesn't matter what units we choose. So that's the sense in which I'm going to discuss fine-tuning examples uh, in a few minutes. So uh, now the thing I divided by that accuracy by is called the comparison range. Okay? So I divided one centimeter by ten centimeters. That's my comparison range, the thing in a denominator. So I need to figure out the comparison range when I discuss examples of fine-tuning in physics and chemistry. Now usually a physical property of the universe is considered fine-tuned for life uh, if, if life life permitting range is less than 10% of the comparison range. Now, most of them are far, far smaller than that. In fact, uh, you know, 10% is, it's more like, you know, 1%, but I just threw in 10% there. Uh, but some of these examples are really astonishing how precise, and far, far more precise than 10%. Now, I'm going to show you some big numbers tonight, and I want to get you a give you a feel for some large numbers. So I'm going to just give you some numbers here. Some of these you may have heard about, you may know about already. Uh, for example, there are about 10 to the 13 cells in the human body. Okay, 10 to the 12th is a trillion, so that's about 10 trillion cells in the human body. That's a big number. The number of seconds in the entire history of the universe, if you take standard Big Bang cosmology, is 10 to the 17th seconds. The number of subatomic particles in the known universe 10 to the 80th power, okay, one with 80 zeros, so number of protons or the number of electrons in the entire observable universe. Having a precision in one part in 10 to the 30th is like firing a bullet and hitting an amoeba at the edge of the observable universe. Okay. So if I give you an example of fine tuning that's more precise than that, then you think back to the amoeba at the edge of the universe hitting it with a bullet. Okay, so, so something, have a mental picture in the back of your head. Okay, so, and I, indeed, I will show you examples of fine-tuning, require fine-tuning greater than that. Um, again, a few, a few uh, kind of defining terms here. Uh, some examples of fine-tuning are what are called one-sided, and others are two-sided fine-tuning. Okay, so the one-sided cases of fine-tuning means that a parameter, a particular parameter of the universe, falls near the edge of the life-permitting region. So in this example, the life-permitting range of this particular parameter goes from this edge to the left. So that would be an upper limit to this whatever particular uh, parameter. And if the actual parameter value is very close to the edge, then you would say that's fine-tuned, that it's one 
side of 22 is because uh, the life permitting range doesn't have an edge on, on the other direction. An example of two sided fine tuning uh, is where you have a lower limit and an upper limit. Okay? And your actual parameter value is somewhere in that range. That would be an example of two sided. Those are more always more impressive on some exams. Some examples of fine tuning are one sided, uh, some are two sided. And some of them are one sided, and we have an inkling that it may be two sided, but more research needs to be done. So, actually, fine, fine tuning. Is an area where there's still active research going. There's room for uh, improvement. So, the first examples I'm going to give you relate to the strengths of the four fundamental forces in the universe. Uh, those four forces, in order of increasing strength, are gravity, the weak force, the electromagnetic force, and the strong force, the strong nuclear force. So uh, the strong and weak force uh, have to do with very close range forces, uh, usually in the nucleus of an atom or between particles that are very close. Electromagnetism uh, and gravity are both long range forces. Now I'm using this variable G naught, G subscript zero, uh, to denote the strength of gravity. And uh, then the other forces are denoted in terms of gravity. So if gravity is G naught, weak force is 10 to the 30 per 30 first times stronger than gravity. Electromagnetic force is 10 to the 37th times stronger than gravity. And the nuclear force is 10 to the 40th times stronger than gravity. So that's what that notation means. So the natural range of force strengths in the universe spans about 40 orders of magnitude. Okay. And so this is a logarithmic scale shown here. Now that's going to be our comparison range. It's an empirical comparison range. It's a comparison range by looking at what are the actual ratios of force strengths in the universe. Now, it's empirical. It's what we actually measure, what we observe in the universe. But it could be theoretically bigger than that. In other words, you ask yourself the question, what could the force strengths have, have been? Could have been other than this? Could the, the range be greater? Well, it could be. Okay? And so that's why this is a lower limit on the actual comparison range. But this is the, the range I'm going to use in comparison because it's empirical. It's what we see. But it could be bigger than that, which means the examples of fine tuning I'll be showing you relating to the strengths of the forces could be even more impressive than the numbers I'll be showing you. Now, Robert Spitzer, who was a Catholic priest and a theoretical cosmologist, former president of Gonzaga University, notes that there are probably about 20 independent constants and factors that are fine tuned to a high degree of precision that are likely possible in the universe about 20 examples. And the number continues to increase at a rate near one per year. In fact, just two weeks ago, there was another paper uh, submitted to the Astro PH preprint server, if any of you check that. Um, <laughs> if you don't, <laughs> you can look it up. Uh, it's, you can download free papers, scientific papers. A uh, paper submitted uh, arguing for fine-tuning of tritium, as the, which is important in the early stages fusion inside stars. Um, so that, that's been their very latest one, just two weeks old. <coughs> so I'll cover, I'll cover a few well-established examples, not the very most recent ones, but some of the ones that have been around for a while and that are pretty well-established. So let's start with our first one is uh, one-sided fine-tuning. Now, the stability of atoms depends on a balance between the strong nuclear force which is an attractive force between protons and neutrons, and the repulsive force of electromagnetism. Okay, in the nucleus of an atom, the protons have the same charge, and so they repel each other with the electromagnetic force. And that has to be balanced by the strong nuclear force. So you can ask yourself, how can we change, how much can you change one or both of these forces and still have a long enough periodic table to have life, complex life possible in the universe? And so you find that you can't increase the electromagnetic force by more than a factor of 14. And so this degree of fine tuning is 14 minus 1 times 10 to the 37. Right? We're using this value of G naught as, 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 as our scale. Divided by 10 to the 40th G naught. 10 to the 40th G naught is our comparison range. It's what goes in the denominator. Okay? And so it's 1%. We'll work out that math. So it's fine tuned to about 1%. Okay, that's, that's okay. That's kind of decent. Uh, what if you change gravity? If you change gravity, you 
affect lots of things. It can affect the, uh, the rate of in which matter coalesces to form galaxies, to form planets, to form stars. So lots of things are affected. If you just look at one of those things, how gravity, changing gravity affects stars, uh, if you increase gra the gravitational constant by a factor of 3,000, compared to what it is in our universe, then the stars will not last any longer than a billion years. And that's important because we think that the sun is very, is uh, four and a half billion years old, and uh, so that this will be in enough time for complex life to arrive on a planet. And so if you calculate the degree of fine tuning, well, it's 3,000 genomes divided by the comparison range times the coordinate of genomes, one part in 10 to the 36. So it's fine tuned to one part in 10 to the 36 power. And I think it's actually more narrow than that when you throw in other things. So that's just its effect on stars. It also affects planets, right? If you increase the surface, if you increase the force of gravity, then the surface gravity on a planet, all else being equal, will be greater, right? If you make it too big, you're going to be crushed. You're going to be squashed. So what, what do you do? You make the planet smaller. If you make the planet smaller, then eventually you can have the right surface gravity uh, in a, in a this hypothetical universe with a stronger gravitational force. Well, what, if, what happens when you make the planet too small? Well, you lose your internal heat to begin with, right? Heat is lost in the planet according to the surface area of the volume ratio. The surface area is the place where the planet loses its heat, and the volume determines how much heat it has inside. That's why all the asteroids and small moons in the solar system are cold, dead moons. They lost their heat early on because they have a large surface area of volume ratio. So I think if you include the, 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 uh, the, the necessity to get planets that have long-lived geology, uh, I think this will constrain it even more. So here's uh, another way of illustrating that degree of fine-tuning for gravity. Uh, imagine a radio dial uh, where you tune in your favorite station. You've got to turn the knob and change uh, the frequency. So you want to tune in to uh, WKLF, K-Life. If you have your dial the size of the universe, the observable universe, 15 billion light years, uh, you would have to dial it to the first angstrom. Okay, that's the degree of fine tuning equivalent to uh, the fine tuning you need for gravity. And that would like uh, possible on the, in the universe. Okay, the third one, um, one sided third example, is the weak force. Now, the weak force mediates uh, the interconversion of protons and neutrons in the early universe. It's also important in supernova explosion if you think that the energy deposited in an exploding supernova by the escaping neutrinos is what helps the supernova explode, otherwise it would collapse. And it's important that a supernova explodes so it can see the interstellar medium with the heavy elements that remain inside that massive star so that rocky planets can form in later uh, generations. Now, the weak force, because it governs or it mediates the interconversion of protons and neutrons, also affects the relative proportion of protons and neutrons that form in the early universe. Okay. In the early universe, it was hot and dense, and there was so dense that protons and neutrons were colliding, and they were colliding with other particles, and protons and neutrons were being interconverted one to the other, mediated by the weak and so if you, if you do the calculations and you increase the weak force by a factor of 30, that changes the initial neutron to proton ratio to 0.9, so meaning it's almost one to one, pretty close. Same number of neutrons there are to protons. And, and it turns out that produces a nearly pure helium universe. That's bad because helium doesn't have any chemistry. That's another story. Okay. And so the degree of finite tuning there is one part in a billion. also governs the radioactive decays in general. And why is that important? Well, in the Earth, most of the heat comes from the radioactive decay of the geological isotopes, potassium, uranium, and thorium. So if you change the weak force, you change heating in the Earth's interior from radioactive decay. So the weak force affects three major areas that, that life depends on, um, geophysical heat sources, uh, the explosion of massive star supernovae, and then early uh, nucleus synthesis in the early universe in the first few minutes. If you wanted to learn about uh, modern physics and what it says about the first few minutes of the history of the universe, I'd recommend a book by Steven Weinberg called The First Three Minutes. The 
one book is about the first three minutes, about the history of the universe. Okay, the next example is carbon production. I'm going to spend a little more time on this one because it's so interesting. And it was one of the very first, if not the first example of fine-tuning discovered in the 20th century. This one was discovered about 60 years ago by Fred Hoyle. And this is not a chemical reaction. That's actually, nu actually a nuclear reaction. And it's three alpha goes to carbon-12. So an alpha particle is basically a helium nucleus. So it's all essentially a three-body collision that occurs when temperatures and densities are high enough in uh, more massive stars so that uh, you have three alpha particles that are usually known that are coming together to form carbon-12. That almost didn't happen in our universe. Uh, in the early 1950s, Fred Hoyle made a prediction. We're here, this carbon-based intelligent life, so somehow carbon-12 get, must get produced. And what would enhance the rate to a level that was necessary to produce carbon-12 inside stars was an unknown excited state of carbon-12, carbon-12 nucleus. 7.7 MeV about above the ground state. So in other words, there was this excited state of the resonance that allowed the reaction to proceed at a higher rate uh, in the nucleus of carbon-12 that was not known. And he said, well, the ha it would have to be there in order for carbon-12 to be produced in stars in significant quantities. And guess what? They found it shortly afterwards. So he predicted its uh, existence had to be there, and it, it was found. But that's not the really interesting part about carbon day. Okay, it's an example of fine-tuning. A uh, paper published in 2000 in Science by Oberhammer, uh, German researchers and, and, and his colleagues, uh, they studied the relative production of carbon and oxygen in, in stars. So they, they, they had a, a, a nuclear model of the nucleus and how nucleons interact and how nuclear reactions take place and also had a stellar model so they put the two together the latest physics basically the latest astrophysics the latest physics is what they used to explore the production of carbon and oxygen in the stars they showed that a 5.5 percent change in the strong nuclear force only four percent change in electromagnetic force would lead to large changes in the c to o ratio of the universe okay due to changes in the energy of the, of the location of the carbon 12 resonance level so that's the first instance of, uh, of fine-tuning in regarding the production of carbon in stars. But wait, there's more. Beryllium-8 is a very short-lived intermediate nucleus. It lives 10 to the minus 16 seconds. That's why I said this is essentially a three-body collision. You need basically to have those three alpha particles coming together at the same time. So you can think of two of them coming together to form beryllium-8. But it lasts 10 to the minus 16 seconds, so the other alpha particle better come by uh, within that time before it decays so that you get carbon carbon 12. And so, but the fact that it has a short half life, a short lifetime, 10 to the minus 16 seconds, prevents a, a runaway fusion that would result in early uh, stellar explosions. Okay, before you can have the light essential heavy elements form inside the star, because carbon is one of the lighter elements, right? calcium and titanium and iron and so on. So the instability of beryllium-8 leads to stellar stability. And so the, the, the lifetime is constrained uh, on beryllium-8. Um, it can't be uh, much shorter or the reaction cannot proceed. And it couldn't be much longer or you would have reactions that proceed too vigorously, too energetically. But wait, there's more. There's also a fine-tuning energy level in oxygen-16. Oxygen-16 is what you get when you add an alpha particle to carbon-12. Okay, so you add another alpha particle, it gets captured car by carbon-12, and you get oxygen-16. Now, it lacks a resonance near the typical alpha particle energy in a star. Now, if it did have a resonance right at that location, most of the carbon will be converted to oxygen. And if there is an energy level, but it's off set a little bit, just the right amount. Okay, so this second fine-tuning instance uh, involves an energy level that's a little bit offset from the typical alpha particle energy. Okay, and so with these two imbalances, these two energy levels, these two resonances, one in carbon-12, one on oxygen-16, you 
you get comparable amounts of carbon and oxygen produced in the universe, the stars. If you went one way or the other, you get either too much carbon and no oxygen or too much oxygen and no carbon. So it's a balance. And we need both. Right? Carbon-based life requires carbon, and it requires oxygen because it's in water. And intelligent life in particular requires oxygen because it's the best oxidizer for chemical reactions and providing energy for metabolism. And there's a fourth fine-tuning instance. Conservation law prevents most of the oxygen-16 from being converted to neon-20 via another optic capture, which has a resonance of the right energy. There's a, uh, a conservation law that applies that, in that particular nucleus that prevents it uh, from all the oxygen from being used up and making neon. So there's a cluster of four fine tunings within a narrow range uh, in the production of carbon and oxygen inside the stars. Pass this bottleneck, you're going to get like heavy ele heavier elements inside the stars. You're going to pass this bottleneck to a point where carbon and oxygen almost didn't happen in the universe. Okay, the cosmological constant, I mentioned this one earlier. That's one of the initial conditions that you have to get right. I'll start with a quote from uh, Lawrence Krauss. Our current understanding of gravity and quantum mechanics says that empty space should have about 120 orders of magnitude more energy than the amount we measure it to have. That's going with 120 zeros after it. How to reduce the, the amount it has by such a huge magnitude without making it precisely zero is a complete mystery. Among physicists, this is considered the worst fine-tuning problem in physics. It's actually not the worst one. It's a good one. It's called a good one. A good example. But it's not the goodest example. And I'm going to show you that one in a few minutes. Now, some of you may have heard of Lawrence Krauss. He's certainly... Uh, no friend of uh, ID and intelligent design or design arguments or, or theism in general. In fact, Bill Craig debated him uh, some months back. But uh, Science Magazine named uh, the cosmological constant for the acceleration of the universe as the science discovery of 1998. Because in 1998, astronomers using supernovae observations discovered the universe was accelerating as the expansion. Okay, early in the 20th century, in 1930, astronomers discovered we live in an expanding universe. Well, in 1998, we discovered we live in an accelerating universe. And there, there, you need to put this constant in the equation of gravity to account for it. Now, we don't know what the nature of this is. We just know that it has to be there. It's some kind of repulsive force, and it, but it has to be fine-tuned to an extremely really high degree. Now, here's the most impressive entropy of the universe. Now, the initial state of space-time that determines the initial state of gravity fields of the early universe were very smooth and homogeneous. Now, with regard to space-time, that means it was very low entropy. Now, the entropy of space-time is greater when you make it bumpier. And the things that make space-time the bumpiest are black holes. So we know what a very high entropy universe is supposed to look like. It's supposed to have lots of black holes. In fact, today, most of the entropy in our universe in space time is contained in black holes. By the way, if you think black holes are real, you're going to have some really strong evidence uh, that black holes exist in the centers of most large galaxies, including ours. So they're no longer just a theoretical idea. We think there's good evidence. Um, now, most of the entropy of the universe is contained in black holes. And we'll continue to grow in entropy as the universe ages because of the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy will increase as the universe is spread over time. Now, by the way, this is also an argument from the beginning of the universe, the fact that uh, the entropy in our universe is decreasing and it started from a very low state. Uh, that's the subject of another talk. So actually, the cosmological argument and the argument from the beginning overlaps with the argument from fine-tuning in a couple of places. This is one of those places. Talking about the entropy of the universe. Now, there are many more ways that the universe can exist in a high entropy state than in a low entropy state. Okay, because there are many more arrangements in bumpy space time that you can make to have the same high entropy that you can in a more low entropy, smooth space time. Now, observations uh, from the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, which is the leftover radiation from when the universe was in a much hotter, denser state, indicate that the early universe was very, very smooth. were smooth to one part in 100,000. And we have really good measurements of this background radiation today from various satellites and other equipment in orbit. 
So the present entropy of the universe is much greater than the initial entropy. And you know, we have empirical evidence now that the initial entropy was very, very small. Now, initially, low entropy is required for a habitable universe in which high entropy structures like stars form out of the surrounding low entropy space time. Stars and planets, and then the condensed things. Roger Penrose estimated that the amount of fine tuning required of the initial entropy to allow for a habitable universe is one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd power. I can't even write it down because I, I can't do a double exponent in my PowerPoint thing. <laughs> so I have to do a little carrot mark. So that means 10 raised to the power, 10 raised to the power 123. Okay. You cannot write that number down. digits in that number, or one atom in our universe is just one digit in that number, you still don't have enough atoms in the universe to write that number down, right? So there are only 10 to the 80th atoms in our universe, or particles. This is 10 to the 10 to the 123rd power. So that's 10 raised to a number that has 123, one followed by 123 zeros after it. And here's an actual illustration from Roger Penrose's book, The Road to Reality, published in 2004. Uh, in case you can't read it, let me read the caption. It's figure 27.21. Creation of the universe, a fanciful description. The creator's pen has to find a tiny box, this one, part 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, on the entire phase space volume in order to create a universe as special, as, as special a big bang as that what we actually find in our universe. So the universe, the initial entropy of the universe was fine-tuned to one part 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, because you need it fine-tuned to that level to have life. That is the most extreme example of fine-tuning known, is the initial entropy of the universe. It puts all the other instances of fine-tuning to shame. None of the others even come close. 10 to the 120th power, that's nothing compared to the 10 to the 10 to the 123rd power. Let me say a few words uh, about multidimensional tuning. And these examples that I've been giving you of fine tuning, they've all been uh, cases where I just vary one parameter, right? Change gravity, or change electromagnetic force, or change the beam force, etc. Um, you might say, well, you can't just change one parameter by holding all the others constant. It's kind of cheating, right? Changing another parameter might compensate for the life inhibiting effects of a particular parameter change. Maybe you know you find that you change one parameter and makes it lifeless to the universe. Well, maybe if you change another parameter, you can fix the problems that the first change made, right? Okay, maybe. Reducing the weak force can be compensated by reducing the mass difference between the protons and the neutrons in your universe. I gave you that example earlier. You increase uh, the weak force by a factor of 30, and you make a universe that ends up being almost pure helium. Well, the production relative amounts of protons and neutrons that you make in the early universe also depends on the mass difference between the protons and the neutrons. So why can't you just fix that problem with the weak forces and it's the wrong strength? Just adjust the values of the proton and neutron. Won't that fix it? Nope. The problem is, is that usually it's the case that changing a parameter has multiple different effects on the universe. So reducing the weak, weak forces, I mentioned before, also affects the explosions of massive stars, supernovae. And it also affects the radioactive decay. You simultaneously affect various properties of the universe at the same time, uh, most of them, and all of which have different effects on life. And so you cannot just compensate by ch when you change one parameter by, uh, by changing another parameter, a different parameter. You can't compensate because then you make other problems. And to fix those other problems, then you change other parameters. And you change those other parameters, and she makes other problems. <laughs> it's like a web. Interdependencies, sort of like that. This is a, a paper published in 2007 by Barr and Kahn. Stephen Barr is a physicist, specializes in particle physics at the University of Delaware. And uh, this is, in case you can't read it, uh, it's a two dimensional uh, fine tuning example where you change the mass of the down quark and the mass of the up quark simultaneously. Uh, up and down quarks are two of the fundamental 
particles of nature, they make up protons and neutrons. So if you change the masses, you can affect a lot of things in nature. And what they find is there are nine distinct effects in the universe, nine different effects of changing uh, the, the mass of the up and forward because the mass is a downward effect. Uh, and that's what each of those curves do. That's what you'll find. Each curve is a different effect on this two-dimensional plot of changing those two uh, fundamental properties of the universe, the mass of the up and forward and the mass of the backward. That little tiny green area there, that little triangle, that's the area that's potentially viable. That's a life-threatening. That's where we live. Okay, so I'm going to say a few words about local tuning. Um, each instance of global, what I'm going to call now global fine tuning, has to be evalu evaluated by its effects on habitability at the local level. What do I mean by local? Okay, by that I mean the structures within the universe that are relevant to life, like galaxies, stars, and planets. Okay, that's what I mean by the local things that are true at a particular place, and so you have a planet, a particular mass that we live on, over a particular star, it lives in a particular galaxy. So it's useful to keep in mind the distinction between global and local fine-tuning. So an example of local fine-tuning would be, for example, of the distance of the Earth to the Sun. That's an example of local fine-tuning. So yes, you do have to fine-tune that parameter, the distance of the Earth to the Sun, so that we can have liquid water on the surface of the Earth and therefore life. But we know that the distance could have been otherwise. Right? There's nothing physically said that the Earth has to be at one astronomical unit to the Sun. It could have been some other place. In fact, we know other planets in our solar system are at other distances. And we see other rocky planets around other stars now with the Kepler mission at various distances from their host stars. So we know that this is something uh, that, that can vary. And we know there are other instances of other planetary systems. Uh, that have a different structure than ours. Now, knowing the number and ranges of properties of galaxies, stars, and planets will allow us to determine if a change to a particular global parameter will have life-ending effects. So in every, every case of uh, fine-tuning concerning a global parameter, like the masses of the fundamental particles, we have to determine its effects at the local level. Right, so how does that affect the formation of planets, uh, radioactive decay inside a planet, and so on? So changing a global parameter uh, may make it impossible for a rocky planet to form at the required distance from its host star uh, to have life on it. And we just have to evaluate it both globally and at the local level. You can think of the local level as passing many different rolls of the dice. There are lots of different stars coming a range of masses. And so the question is, are there enough probabilistic resources in our universe? somewhere, given the possible ranges of planets that we find uh, in the universe. Uh, so certainly some small amount of change in some local parameters can be tolerated, uh, but not very much, as I mentioned before, with some of these examples. And so to evaluate uh, cases of fine-tuning, you know, you're going to need to know details of star and planet formation, climate stability, orbital dynamics, stellar nuclear synthesis, and so on. So um, I've already mentioned some of these, like stellar nuclear synthesis, the, the triple alpha reaction, right? Depends on the details of the strong nuclear force, the larger nuclear force, and so on. So that's all I want to say about local tuning, so you don't get those two confused. Keep those separate in your mind, the global tuning. Today what I'm talking about is global tuning, parameters that apply to the whole universe, that are true everywhere, but they do have to be evaluated at the local level for effects on, say, the surface of the planet, where you have life. So what? Okay, so what are the implications? So that's what I'll discuss the rest of the time, along with a, uh, one or more, more, a couple of object objections. So a little bit of history. Um, the ancients were all inspired by the beauty of the night sky, the beauty of nature, and the order of nature. And, uh, in fact, in Psalm 19, one of the Bible, it says that, heavens declare the glory of God. So the ancient Hebrews, the ancient Greeks were all inspired by and uh, took to believe in the mind, the designer, a God uh, from the orderliness of nature, the, the beauty of nature, and especially the night sky because it's universal and accessible to everybody and uh, you know, it's really awe-inspiring, especially when you get away from city lights. You get to see the Milky Way. So belief 
human God from the design of nature goes back a thousand of years, at least from the written record. You can think of the universe as a kind of artifact. Uh, we discovered certain patterns within this artifact. And what does this tell us about its cause? Well, let's give you a couple of quotes. One from Plato. Evidence for God comes from the order of the motion of the stars and all the things under the dominion of the mind which ordered the universe. And then Aristotle, uh, I'm going to give a quote from Aristotle in just a second, but uh, let me just set it up. He's uh, discussing a hypothetical situation where people had lived underground for a long time and then they came up to the surface for the first time and looked up at the sky for the first time. And here's what he writes. When the night had darkened the land so that they should behold the whole sky spangled and adorned with stars, and when they should see the rising and setting of all these celestial bodies, when they should behold all these things, most certainly they would have judged that all these marvelous works are the handiworks of the gods. So both Plato and Aristotle uh, and other ancient Greek philosophers believed in the design of the order and beauty of nature. So did the Romans, the Stoics in particular, Cicero's writings on design sound very modern. historical event. Uh, think of it that way. Uh, so the question is, how do you reconstruct historical events in a fair sequence to determine what is the best explanation, what is the best, best cause that accounts for that artifact? And so I'd like to show you a simple illustration uh, to explain how we rationally reconstruct past events. Okay. I used to live in Seattle for many years, and I would travel to Victoria to use your Dominion Astrophysical Observatory on the Vancouver Island. I would often take the ferry. And uh, when I arrived, I'd see this pattern of flowers by the shore, uh, dark flowers arranged in this pattern that you see there that uh, you can read, Welcome to Victoria, and against the background of white flowers. So it's this pattern, dark flowers against white flowers. I wasn't there to see how this pattern was created. Now, this is a silly example, and I think you know what the answer is, but let's just pretend we discovered this for the first time. We don't know anything about how flowers grow or anything like that. <laughs> and so uh, we want to historically reconstruct this event, determine what is the best explanation for this pattern. Okay, not all science is laboratory based. Some of science is historical, okay? And that ge includes geology, archaeology, cosmology, are all historical sciences, okay? Um, now, there are some laboratory sciences like chemistry or biology which are chemicals in real time because they're, they're the persons in control of things. But if it's geology and you're digging up some geologic layer, you weren't there to see how it was made, how it was formed. You have to just reconstruct this histor historical event. In cosmology, you have to reconstruct the history in the universe. Astronomers only have the past, right? You can only see the past if you can see the present. Uh, cosmology, again, is the study of the distant universe. And so there's um, a type of reasoning that's appropriate to the historical sciences to reconstruct the past. That's called abductive reasoning or inference to the best explanation. It's the way causal explanations are reached in the historical sciences. So abductive reasoning infers unseen causes in the past from facts in the present. You discover an artifact or pattern and you want to determine the causal explanation. You apply the principle of uniformitarianism. And a little, little ditty you might want to remember is present is key to the past. Right? The present is key to the past. This principle of uniformitarianism. It applies the same kinds of causal explanations we use in everyday life infer the best explanation from past unobserved events. So an artifact or pattern could be the result of several causes. And what you do is you set up competing hypotheses based on mutually exhaustive causal explanations and choose the best one. So what is the list of mutually exhaustive causal
Global Explanation of Bell Crane Gable Team. Anybody remember? Necessity, chance, or design? Mutually exhaustive possible. Mutually exhaustive means if you eliminate only two of those, you're left with the third one as the, um, the only answer. It's the Sherlock Holmes approach. So, necessity. experience, we know that there are three basic causal explanations for events. And so you can propose competing hypotheses for the observed pattern. So let's talk specifically about the, 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 uh, flower, the flowers. So let's propose a chance hypothesis. Okay. So birds flew over the patch of soil and ran randomly to opposite ends. A wind blew the seeds in and this and that. So whatever you want. Chance hypothesis. Necessity. That's our second hypothesis. That's our necessity hypothesis. <laughs> okay. And design. Okay. Some, someone with knowledge of the English language planted the seeds to form a meaningful pattern. That's sort of like the best explanation to you. <laughs> okay. So, the way flowers grow has nothing to do with the English language. So, necessity is out. The pattern is complex. Okay. There are lots of flowers. Several letters strung together to form proper spelling, have correct grammar, and with a clear meaning. Okay, now, if there were no meaningful pattern, chance could be the best explanation for it at this point. Because any arrangement of the same number of black and white flowers would be the same in probability. Okay, the, the key here is that it forms a meaningful pattern. So chance is out. So with recombination, Darwinism is also out. This leaves design. if once you infer design as the best explanation, you can determine a purpose. Now, sometimes you know that something is designed, but you, you don't know the purpose of it. Smithsonian has a really good book. You know, obviously designed, but you don't know the purpose of it. But if you can infer the purpose, then that gives you even stronger evidence that indeed it was designed. So flowers, for flowers, the purpose is to provide a greeting to passengers of the ferry arriving in Necessity. Now here I want to distinguish between physical necessity given by the physical laws within the universe and logical necessity. The properties of the universe we observe are not logical necessarily. They didn't have to be like that. They could have been otherwise. The strength of gravity could have been something else, or the strength of the other forces or the masses of particles could have been something else. In fact, physicists have come up with self-consistent theories that I'll be discussing in just a few minutes, uh, like M theory, that uh, show how you can have different combinations of 
metaphysical concepts, other possible universes. So, necessity is just ruled out as an explanation uh, to explain to the other world of the universe. You can't say, well, they had to be the world. No, they didn't have to be that world. There have been other worlds. And finally, correlation of the conditions that allow for life and define to the parameter values of the universe we observe forms a meaningful pattern. It is a meaningful pattern because there is something interesting about life permitting universes that is lacking in life, non-life permitting universes. I challenge anybody to tell me that non-life permitting universes are just as interesting and have just as much value as a life permitting universe. The universe with a the little sea of hydrogen is just as interesting as one that allows complex beings like us that can think and reason. So we can make a design argument, uh, and again, Bill Craig very briefly mentioned this. Fine-tuning of the universe is due to logical necessity. The only change I made with them is the word logical. I didn't replace physical with logical. Logical necessity, chance, or design. Okay. Now, it's not due to logical necessity or chance. Therefore, it is due to design. Okay, so that's the design, the argument for design in the universe from the fine-tuning. Now, I'm going to discuss the most frequent objection to the design argument in fine-tuning and involves appeal to what's called the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle is a recognition that our very existence constrains the properties of the universe we observe to be those that allow for our existence. In other words, we can only observe a half of the universe. We can only observe ourselves as being a half of the universe by definition. It seems like a tautology, right? And it is, but it's a helpful reminder that we have to take into account observer self-selection bias when interpreting our observations. Our sample in the universe is necessarily biased. Now, the anthropic principle does not explain why there exists a universe fine-tuning for life in the first place. That's what many people fail to consider. Now, let me give you a little illustration to try to help you understand why the anthropic principle doesn't explain why a fine universe, or why a fine-tuned universe exists in the first place. In 1963, an astronomer, Martin Schmidt, discovered that quasars are very distant uh, celestial objects, but they're very large redshifts. And uh, because of this, um, it was discovered that they're very luminous objects. They're very far away. So the question is, why are they so luminous? So I'm going to propose two hypotheses, or two explanations, as to why they might be so luminous. Here's the wrong answer. Because if they weren't so luminous, we wouldn't be able to see them. <laughs> if we see an object in the distant universe, then it must be very luminous. Well, that's not really an explanation. <laughs> so here's the right answer. Quasars are powered by the gravitational energy released by matter falling into a supermassive black hole. So the moral of the story here is that noting that if we observe an object in the very distant universe, then it must be very luminous, does not explain why, why the object exists in the first place, or what gives it its, its high luminosity. Okay? It's simply stating a necessary condition for us to observe that quasar. It doesn't explain why that quasar exists in the first place. Okay? Similarly, for our universe, we have a given anthropic explanation that doesn't explain why multiverse objection adds something new, something more to that. Now, if there exists a vast multiverse of many other universes, then the probabilistic resources available to account for our finely tuned universe by chance are increased. Then we could appeal to the anthropic principle. So, for example, let's say you want to flip ten heads in a row, and flip a coin, and get heads ten in a row. If you just do it ten times, it's not very likely for it to happen. So what if you give yourself more probabilistic resources? What if you give yourself weeks to do it? You say, okay, I'm going to take it. I mean, until I get 10 heads in a row. Then you've increased your probabilistic resources. So then when you get 10 heads in a row, then it's not a big deal. It's not, it's, then you can attribute it to chance. But if you got 10 heads in a row on your first try, you say, okay, that coin's rigged. It's designed to give me heads every time I flip it. So other universe scenarios include, uh, I'm just going to give you some tough names here, string theoretic landscapes, a pre-Big Bang, an inflationary model, etc. 
Tyrotic model. Now, inflation is the one, I'm sorry, sorry, and some cosmologists try to make the case that a, a multiverse actually exists, and so these are some of the models. Inflation is the one I'm going to spend some time on because that's the most popular one. In fact, it's called chaotic eternal inflation. Uh, Alan Guth proposed inflation uh, about 30 years ago to account for the so called flatness in homogeneity problems. Uh, actually, there weren't any that could violate it, find, uh, find, um, sorry, the laws of physics. Uh, there were just examples of fine tuning. Uh, and I was just told that I have five minutes left. So I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to skip the background on inflationary cosmology. Um, but just tell you that there are problems with this cosmology. In fact, cosmologists are beginning to abandon it. Uh, Paul Steinhardt, a cosmologist who used to be a supporter of it, said, we thought that inflation predicted a smooth, flat universe. Instead, it predicts every possibility an infinite number of times. We're back to square one, close quote. Max Tegmark, who I mentioned earlier, uh, has similar comments. Sean Carroll, the author of the Elegant Universe, wrote, quote, we can pick a universe out of a hat. It's not going to be one that starts with inflation, close quote. Inflation, rather than solving the flatness and homogeneity problems, pushes fine-tuning one step back and requires other special initial conditions and assumptions. In fact, it makes uh, the initial entropy problem even worse. It magnifies it. And so, um, it, but just for the sake of the argument, I'm just going to assume inflation <laughs> is correct uh, for the sake of this multiverse argument. Now, I need to give you a background on one more thing called the Boltzmann multiverse. This is something that comes up in the cosmological method. And it goes like this. Now, one of the evidences for uh, a beginning to the universe, a beginning to time, is the fact that the universe has not reached thermal equilibrium. It hasn't reached the heat death yet. Uh, and so that's, if, if the universe were infinite in age, it would, we have, would have reached equilibrium, thermal equilibrium an infinity of time ago. And so that's evidence that there was a beginning to time. Now, Boltzmann, Ludwig, Ludwig Boltzmann, century, said, well, the whole vast universe really isn't thermal equilibrium, except well, only we observe this tiny little patch, and he called it a world. And this patch is out of equilibrium just by chance, called a statistical fluctuation. Okay, and so the question is, well, it's okay, we really have reached heat death, but not in this tiny uh, little patch that we observe as our universe has, it hasn't reached statistical equilibrium yet. Uh, and so the problem is the, the bigger the patch is, the more improbable it is, and just by counting the number of atoms up. And so the universe is much vaster than it needs to be to account for our existence. In fact, if you just have the solar system pop out of a statistical fluctuation, okay, it's much more probable than getting this big, vast universe that we have pop out of a statistical fluctuation. Uh, but the fact that we see a big universe means that if this really is the case, if this little patch of our world grew out of a statistical fluctuation, um, then it must be all an illusion. All these stars we see are really not there. Uh, everything beyond the solar system is an illusion. Uh, so we have to believe in sort of an illusion world. And so it was rejected uh, for that reason. Um, now, the, the Boltzmann universes make uh, argument is relevant to the multiverse arguments to make. Uh, let me read you this quote by Roger Penrose. First of all, do we really need the whole observable universe in order that sentient life can come about? This seems unlikely. Let us be generous and ask that a region the radius one-tenth of the observable universe must, must resemble the universe that we know. But we do not care about what happens outside that radius. We can estimate how much more frequently the creator comes across the smaller than the larger regions. The figure is no better than 10, one, than 10 to the 10 to the 125. Okay, so you see that an incredible extravagance of value in terms of probability for the creator to bother to produce this extra distant part of the universe that we don't actually need for our existence. In other words, if we live in a multiverse generated by a process like chaotic inflation, then for every observer who observes a universe of our size, there are 10 to the 10 to the 123rd power uh, who observe a universe that is just 10 times smaller. Okay, so that means that the universe, if we really did arise from chaotic inflation, from just a quantum uh, fluctuation out of a vacuum, uh, then the universe that we see beyond our region of space, our, say, nearest few uh, million light years, not really there. It's an illusion. Okay. The 
you take this to the extreme, you have what are called false two brains. Okay. Taking it to the extreme, we can have a universe. We can have a universe pop out of a quantum fluctuation that contains one brain. Those one brains are by far the most common observers in the multiverse, given their small size. Smaller the object, the smaller the universe, the more probable it is. So it's far more probable to occur in a multiverse than I mean, for for a multiple twin brain to occur in a multiverse than our vast fine-tuned universe with its long history. And so you're more likely to be a free-floating brain than a person with a real history living in a 13.7 billion year old universe. The world we observe then is an illusion. You're the only person who actually exists. All your memories are false. The probability of forming our universe out of a quantum fluctuation in its present state with the appearance of age is more likely than forming it with its finely tuned like an initial condition of a quantum history. And so this is what we call the attack of the multiple brains. Um, and this is a, a real conundrum for multiverse advocates. They basically have to give up realism. The whole world around them is an illusion. So they don't want to believe in the multiverses because the most common observer in the multiverse is a full twin brain. Second problem with the multiverse scenario is you have to reject rationality. Multiverse cosmology can explain the origin of all events, no matter how improbable, as long as they're not impossible, by reference to chance because of the infinite probabilistic resources that the reports generate. Events we explain in terms of known causes based on ordinary experience could just as readily explain multiverse cosmology as chance occurrences without any causal antecedent. No way to attribute events to causal physical laws. Anything can be attributed just as readily to human design or to chance fluctuations in the quantum vacuum of the infinite zone. In some universe, you are a great musician but don't have an ounce of musical talent. Every time you hit the key on the musical keyboard, you play a beautiful piece of music, but you really don't understand anything about the music. And all causes that seem to be related to effects really aren't. They're just chance fluctuations, chance effects. And so you do away with the possibility of all scientific reasoning, because scientific explanation and reasoning are unreliable. You must believe in random miracles. The scientific method is dead in the multiverse. So what is the best explanation? Design is the best explanation for the fine-tuning of the universe. From our uniform and repeated experience, objects we know are designed are always associated with minds or never otherwise. Multiverse cosmologies invoke causes that have no, we have no experience with. And anthropic explanations fail on our universe. But we do have direct experience with minds. Starting with our own minds, right? First hand experience. So you can think of the universe as a kind of artifact. That artifact points to a designer. Now, if you add to this the evidences of upward beginning to the universe from uh, another session, the cosmological argument, then you have a cause of the design already available to you. So if you already accept the cosmological argument, there's, there's, there's a cause there for you waiting in the wings to, to employ and explaining the design of our universe via the fine-tuning. So the designer, the cause of the universe must be the designer uh, who has transcended the material and the mind that will exist in a timeless eternity. And I think that's quite consonant with the, the Christian there, so I do have just a few minutes remaining. Uh, questions? Yeah. What about other life? On, okay, so is there, is there life on other planets? Yeah, but what do I think about it? Okay, so what do I think about life on the worlds? Um, one of my areas specialties is astrobiology, and I study exoplanets, I study the properties of stars around other planets. So I've been interested in, in the topic of astrobiology for a long time. I'm, I'm unusual, and I'm one of the few people in astrobiology doing research who's a skeptic. Um, so um, 
astrobiology is an interesting field as a field without a subject. It's a field without a subject. We don't have evidence for life elsewhere. Um, and I think the more we learn about what you need for life, right? I mentioned one of them was the local tuning, like right distance from the sun. There's many, many others. We keep discovering new ones that are important for climate stability, long-term climate stability, and stability on a planet. Um, um, I did research um, on uh, the Galactic Habitable Zone. And so I developed a concept called the Galactic Habitable Zone with my colleagues Don Bradley and Peter Ward uh, with both Rare Earth uh, called the Galactic Habitable Zone. Not only is there a region around the sun where you need to be to have a stable planet, but there's a region in the galaxy itself where you need to too close to the center of the galaxy because there are many dangerous things like supernovae, uh, perturbations of the atomic cloud and things like that. Uh, it restricts the region you can be in the galaxy. So the more we learn about the kind of conditions you need for complex life in particular, in my view, uh, the more it narrows uh, the possibility for finding life elsewhere to make it more improbable. Uh, now, I, I don't know the probabilities well enough yet to say that we're alone in the universe. I can't say categorically, okay, we know the probabilities now enough for getting an Earth-like planet for life well enough to say we're alone in the universe. We can't make that statement. But the more we learn about just what needs to go right, especially for complex life, the more it seems to me that it makes that uh, more unlikely that there is especially complex life out there uh, in other places. Um, just one more thing I want to say. We've looked at other places in the solar system for life. We've looked on Mars. We're continuing to look on Mars. There was excitement in 1996 when NASA scientists announced the possibility of life on a Martian meteorite, Alan Helsing 4001. But that evidence has since been discredited. And so at this point, there is no evidence for life on Mars. And uh, frankly, I think it's likely that the Earth seeded Mars early on on the impact region for a big impact on the Earth. I think we seeded Mars early on. But even with an early, early inoculation of our bugs, apparently they didn't take. So Mars is too Mars-like, not Earth-like enough, apparently. So it orbits the same star we do. It orbits in close proximity to, proximity to the Earth. It probably got an early helping from some of our bugs, but yet it didn't take. That's about, you know, so we, all, everything's for it. So the right part of the galaxy, yet even even our closest neighbor doesn't have life out there. So I just this is an empirical data point showing you just how much you need to get right, uh, and even with an early helping, apparently it's not enough. So, but I, I try to keep an open mind. Theologically, you could have life on other worlds, or you could have life that's just on this world. Theologically, God could make a universe filled with life, or make a universe with life on only one planet. I don't know which one it is. But empirically, it's looking like it's life is very rare. I don't know if it's unique to Earth, but it's very rare. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. is about uh, some of these prominent physicists and cosmologists who use words like elegance and beauty. In fact, some of them have been quite explicit in the beauty of the, some of the equations of physics, their elegance, their symmetry. The Maxwell's equations right, are beautiful in certain, certain senses. And so uh, the question is, you know, they don't want to use the word design, but yet they use these words that we usually attribute to designers. Designers produce beautiful things. Things are elegant. Uh, and I, I think it, it's hard to get around it. We do see a world around us which is beautiful and elegant. Now, I didn't make the argument for design from that direction, uh, from beauty. I think it's a harder one because it's hard to quantify beauty, but it's 
something you sense intuitively, subjectively, more? Yeah, it's like the moral, sorry, it's like the moral argument. Uh, but even the moral argument, I think, has a, more, a little bit more objectivity to it. But I think there, is, there can be a design argument made from the argument from beauty, especially gratuitous beauty. Necessary for our existence, like the rainbow, or the beauty of the night sky, or things like that, or the beauty of solar eclipses, um, as it seems to be gratuitous. Um, for instance, <laughs> and he wasn't. Um, I guess I saw some crystal back there. the formation of a star. Okay, so the question is, has anybody ever witnessed the formation of a star? I'd say witnessing the formation of a star in real time and actually seeing it is hard to do because star, young stars, stars that we know are very young, are usually in what are called uh, molecular clouds. They're large interstellar clouds that are in, and where stars form are in the densest regions of those clouds, like look through a small telescope at the Orion Nebula. That's a region of uh, space with a giant molecular cloud where we think there are very young stars located there. The thing is, the youngest stars are still enveloped by dust. And so when you see and what you think is a new star, is it a new star that just turned on or is it a new star that just became visible because it's starting to blow away the dust that's enveloping it like a, in a cocoon? And so I would say it will be something that's very hard to do, to actually see a new star actually forming. Where you, yesterday you didn't see a star, today you see something turned on. To know whether or not it was really a star that formed, or it just became visible for the first time because the, the dust veil started to part. Uh, I'd say it's observationally it's a very difficult thing. I don't know if there's an easy answer to your question about we know of stars that we think are extremely young because of several properties. Uh, stars that are very, very massive, like we have in the Orion Nebula that don't live very long. Uh, stars that are enshrouded by dust. We know that old stars are not enshrouded by dust, so we know that something that changes over time. Stars are born in dusty, gaseous regions, nebulae. And when we see old stars, uh, like uh, star clusters, as we just can determine we We can make those kinds of observations, but actually seeing a star actually appear where there wasn't one before, um, plus it's a slow process, I don't think I have a definite answer to that. Yeah, sorry. fine-tuned for us, or were we fine-tuned for the universe, or were God's creation? It depends if you think that we're created in our present form without any development over time. Uh, now, this gets into the question of how, how much, what kind of activity is there by God within the history of the universe to account for our, our arrival here? arguments I've shown tonight or the argument for design for fine-tuning doesn't presuppose any involvement by God. So let me just start this kind of backwards and say that you can use this argument with anybody because it's based on the publicly available evidence of nature. You don't have to presuppose God in order to show that there's evidence for God in the fine-tuning of the concepts of nature. Now, whether or not God intervened and how he intervened throughout history to prepare us and at the same time by preparing the universe. I don't know. I keep an open mind uh, about that. I, re I really don't know. Uh, but what I can say is that there's direct, there's really strong evidence that something had to be set up just right when the universe was being created at the beginning. Now, how much?
which occurred later, I don't know, in terms of actual empirical evidence. Um, now, I happen to be a Darwin skeptic, and I think uh, Darwinism kind of explained lots of things about life, like the origin of life, the origin of major body plans, the origin of Cambrian explosion, and so on. So I think there is room for a designer uh, to intervene and affect life in history, but that's a separate topic. So the fine-tuning that we observe in our universe, if we're Boltzmann brain, is an illusion. In fact, you don't need to fine-tune uh, a Boltzmann brain universe, right? Because it's just a statistical fluctuation. So to have the most common observer in the multiverse, you don't need fine-tuning. So that's why you know, there's a way to fine-tuning. And but if there isn't fine-tuning observed, right, it's a, a statistical fluctuation. That's how the multiverse person would well, would. Uh, for it, but yeah, it's it's not real. Yeah, I, I'd say it just goes nowhere. You know, the Boltzmann, you don't have to go any farther than to say you have to believe in illusionism, and then you're the only real brain, you're the only real mind in this room. It's the only real observer. <laughs> stars using the transit method. So it's looking at light variations as the planet transits from the most close star uh, and determining uh, the presence of planets. And we're finding that these other planetary systems have very different architectures uh, than ours. In fact, it's, you know, ours is looking more and more like the exception with nice circular orbits, a little planar. Um, you know, it, it's unusual to find planetary systems that have circular orbits. Our planet is characterized by highly circular orbits, uh, which are you know, more stable in long time periods. So uh, these planetary systems that are being found around other stars uh, would not allow for a terrestrial planet to exist with a nice circular orbit because it would be perturbed by these more massive planets and make its orbit less circular. And our orbit, Earth's orbit, is almost a perfect circle. We've got an eccentricity of 0.016. For those of you who know a little bit about geometry, that's very, very near is important for climate stability. The fact that we have a very circular orbit. In fact, the Milankovitch cycles, which are thought to be the explanation of the ice ages, are caused by very tiny changes in the orbital properties of the Earth and the shape of its orbit and, and the tilt of its axis. And even those very tiny changes lead to the ice ages, which are very dramatic and extreme. Um, I was told that we were supposed to go up to 930. So I think we're supposed to stop now, is that right? Yeah. I'd be happy to talk some more.